I'm going to go through the entire eGrants application really quickly and show you what you need to click on, sort of give you some pointers on what to put in. So that is the website right there and what I do to find it is I just type FEMA eGrants and it's usually the first Google search that pops up and I, I click on it. <coughs> there is a independent study on the FEMA website if you wanted to have a FEMA presentation on how to use eGrants you can take that at any time um, so in order to use eGrants you're going to actually have to um, register for it or submit permission to be able to use it um, and we'll go through that really quick yeah, sorry, sorry, Jenna, go ahead. So we will say the community should get access to it because we've had oh, situations yes. where people had their engineering firm get access to it for the grant and then they ended up changing engineering firms between mm -hmm. when they did the application and the project and then nobody could get onto the program to edit stuff or see what the grant was. So just make sure, I mean, you can, you know, potentially share information then change the passwords and stuff like that later, but make sure that the community, that the applicant is the one who has the access and is inputting the information. Yes, thank you for that. So whoever is in charge in the community that's going to do it, I would recommend they be the one to submit an eGrants. But what you can do is once you're in, you can give permission to other people. So you can give permission to the engineering firm and others to go in and add stuff into your eGrants application. Um, so this is what it looks like when you log on. You're going to see this here. And if you have never used eGrants before, you're going to be you're going to click on the new non-PIV user and it'll take you to whether or not you're a robot. Once you're past there, you just fill out basic information and you submit it. And once you've submitted it, you need to email Brad and say, hey, I submitted into eGrants, can you give me access? So if you just submit it, you got to let Brad know, I mean, so he can go in there. And then once he gives you access, then you can go in now and log into eGrants with your username and password. So this is what it'll look like when you log in. It always says that. You can click on your profile or you can just continue right on to eGrants. And you'll see this screen here. Some of them might, look, might have a, a few more options. But you can print a blank application. And if any of you want those today, we can print those off for you now if you want to see what the entire application looks like and what you need to prepare for it. Create a new application, update, complete, unsubmitted application or revise, amend a submitted application. So if you have already, if you have an application from a previous year, you can actually copy that for it, uh, the current year and use one that's already in there. <coughs> so if you're not, you click on create new application if this is your first time. And it'll take you to this screen here. Application title. Do you remember what the pointers were on the title? You need to say what your activity is and your community or location or it's a mitigation plan in the community. Then you click on this screen application type and you go to the drop down menu and there's a project, a planning, a management cost and a technical assistance application. You'll just click either project or planning. I've never seen the other ones are different for different reasons, unless you were doing a technical assistance thing. But so project or planning, and they'll take you to different screens. So the project application has a few more uh, options in eGrants, and the planning one is a little bit more sim uh, more simpler, much more simple. Okay, so you clicked on that, and you want to click on start new application so it has maybe what you did your application title this one says the Brigham City Manaway flooding mitigation project as an example in the application year so you want to click start new application 
or if you wanted to copy an existing application from a previous year, you would click on the copy button. So you, it would just transfer over and then you could go in and edit it. Have any other questions changed the last year? No, I, I haven't heard any update in the eGrant since then. So this is, this is what it looks like. So you have 13, 13 items here and you can submit when all of these are complete. So you can click on any at any time, you don't have to go in order and you can update them. Um, you have the save and continue and go back. I highly recommend that you do not push the back button on your browser, but that you use the actual go back button because it can kind of mess it up. Yeah, sometimes, uh, yeah, it seems like Explorer might, might be the best. We've had something, you might be able to do it fine, but sometimes when you upload things, then FEMA can't see it. I don't know what the reason is on some of those. Yeah, you can open it in Chrome or Firefox, and you can usually open things up and move around and see it. But, like, we can't print off completed applications. We can't do anything other than look at stuff. And like make small edits in Chrome, we have to open Internet Explorer in order to be able to do all of our functions. So I would recommend maybe just doing it in Internet Explorer because you don't want to think you've uploaded your documents and then find out you haven't or stuff like that. So. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to go through these really quick so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, just really quick, so those are the differences. So the project application has environmental, a cost effectiveness, and a properties tab that is different. And the scope of work has more pages to it um, rather than the planning. Everything is the same except for the scope of work page. So here's first one, sub applicant, or I guess number two. You have the name of the sub applicant. So that would be your community, if it, whatever city or if you're a district or, or whatever, state, the type of sub-applicant. So we have other ones besides, you know, we have special districts that apply or we have state agencies that apply. Um, and then some of the things Jana said, your EIN and DUNS number. So those are the required ones with the uh, red asterisks. Um, oh, I guess I highlight some of these here. So when you just click on these underlinks, they just give you a description of what they're looking for if you're, if you're, if you're wondering. Um, oops. Um, so the type of sub-applicant, if you're a state or local government, Indian, Indian tribal government, a special district, or private nonprofit. If you don't know how to find the EIN, you click on that. It can take you to a, a website to help you find in the DUNS. So these ones are pretty basic, just basic sub-applicant information. Display the public entities. You can click on that button and it can uh, take you to a list so you can try to find the public entity. And then you click save and continue and you'd be done with that one. So that one's pretty, pretty simple. So three, this is the contact information, the point of contact. Um, there's I think space for two of them, like the, the authorized subgrant agent and the point of contact. Um, so any questions on that? It's pretty easy. <laughs> Just put in the, the contact information, push save and continue. So this is your community information. Um, so you have that find community button. If you click on that and then you can search, you can have several parameters on what you want to do search, whether by community name or the other ones. And then you can click search to try to find the community. Now, what happens if your project encompasses multiple communities? What should you do? You got to put all the communities in. So, I mean, we have for like mitigation plans, we have maybe a county and then you would include all the cities that are, are going to participate in that plan or if your project goes across multiple communities, 
then you could put the multiple communities in. And once you click on that, it'll auto-populate that whole thing when you find your, your uh, community. So there's an example, Bountiful City included both of the congressional districts, that's why there's two, and the community is good. And if you want to attach any files, there'll be an option there, and then you can click uh, Save and Continue. So we've done sub-applicant, contact, and community. We're complete. That's kind of what it looks like if you, if you saw it when it was done. And then now we'll go on to the mitigation plan. <coughs> so it'll ask, is the entity that will benefit from the proposed activity covered by a current FEMA approved multi-hazard mitigation plan? So as of currently, everyone, it should be yes, unless it's a special district or something that never participated in, in a plan. Click yes. And what is the name of the plan? Now I highly recommend that you do not click on the plans repository or find plan. Um, if you, you do not click on those. So when you click on those, it'll list up a bunch of mitigation plans. But I find personally that a lot of them may be inaccurate and they may have just a whole bunch of ones with weird names. There's an option right next to it to just type it in. And on the thing we'll send you, I have the, the title of the plan and the approval date. I would just type it in because a lot of them are inaccurate, have wrong dates. Um, so I would just type in the plan. Um, so for North Salt Lake, it would be the Davis County Mitigation Plan and the approval date. And you would just type that in there when it was approved by FEMA. And then here's the one. And if you guys want later, I could go through an example, but describe how the proposed activity relates to or is consistent with the FEMA approved mitigation plan. So that's where you actually need to go into your local hazard mitigation plan, go into the mitigation strategies portion and find out where your project correlates with something in the local mitigation plan with a, a goal or a strategy in there. If they have a goal to mitigate flood risk, then you can say, in this section here, it, you know, it says that they want to mitigate flood risk and our project is to do that. So just a quick uh, couple sentences on how the project correlates with the local mitigation plan. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, does the entity have any other mitigation plans adopted? Typically, it's no. I do know like the School Valley Goshu Tribe just had a flood, flood mitigation plan, but I, it was only the School Valley Band, so they, they could click yes on that. Okay, so for the type of plan, I missed that one. What is the type of plan? So they have these options here, local multi-jurisdictional multi-hazard mitigation plan, local multi-hazard mitigation plan, and then three tribal ones, a multi-jurisdictional, a multi-hazard, or a tribal mitigation plan. So for the top one, if it's a multi-jurisdictional plan, if there's more than one jurisdiction in the plan, click that option. If it's a single one, you click it. I only know currently of two or three single ones, which would be Saratoga Springs, Castle Valley, and the special districts. All the other ones are multi-jurisdictional unless it is a single jurisdiction. Like only one city or a county and there's no cities in the county. That would be the option. So I'd click this top one here, local multi-jurisdictional multi-hazard mitigation plan. And if you're doing a new plan, you would do what it is. So if it's just the tribe, then it would be a single. But if it involved multi-jurisdictions, you'd click the appropriate one for whatever uh, plan you, you were doing. So like I say, I wouldn't click on the find, find plan, I would just type in the things and there's the examples. And approved plan status, they're all approved right now. Um, except for when they, you do a new plan, it'll have something different. So I just showed an option of kind of what it looks like when you do the find the plan. Um, it'll have a whole bunch of these ones. 
And I, I just, I would avoid that, but you're welcome to navigate that if you want and try to find the correct one. I don't know how often they update these and you'd have to make sure they have the proper approval date. And then describe how the proposed activity relates to us because those are some examples of what some people have put um, in, in some of the applications that we've had. As you can kind of see, they, have, they list the actual action in the plan or things like that. A planning grant's a little bit more simple because you're updating the plan, so. And those are just some examples, some of the other plans. If you have an FMA plan or a CRS plan, then that's another a mitigation plan you could add to it. Um, save and continue when you're done with that. So typically, so far, most of those people don't have problems. The only problems are they don't have the correct name of the plan and the correct approval date. Um, now, this, this one asks about the state plan. Does the state of Utah have a FEMA approved plan? The answer is yes. It was approved on March 20th of 2014 is the, is the approval date. Um, the type of plan, so everyone should pick the standard state multi-hazard mitigation plan. That is the only mitigation plan that the state of Utah has. We do not have an enhanced. <coughs> so it would be the, I guess, third option, the standard state. And in the, the aid that we'll send you out, it has the title of the plan and the approval date and which one to pick. Um, so, so pick that one. Do not pick enhanced or anything else, and it's approved. And that's, that's one in the repository. Um, that one has the wrong date, as you can see. It says it was approved on May 2nd, and it was actually approved on March 20th. So that's an example of I would not recommend using the plan rep repository function. And then describe how the proposed activity relates to or is consistent with the state plan. So if you don't know what the state plan is, just do a Google search and say Utah State Hazard Mitigation Plan. And it'll pull up a Google site. And there's a chapter, I think it's chapter three, I believe, called Mitigation Strategies. And it has a whole bunch of strategies per hazard. And you could find a strategy that hopefully your project can fall under and you would list that and say the state hazard mitigation plan has this strategy or goal and our, our project is consistent with that. Is that being updated now? We are updated. We are currently almost hopefully finished. By, uh, by spring it should be approved. So yeah, we are currently doing that now but it won't apply for this because the grant will be closed before, so you have to use the 2014 plan. Um, but on that note, if you guys do have any other suggestions for strategies, so in the future, we could include those in the plan, so then we have that in the state plan, so you can point to it and say, make sure this is in there, so in the future, it'll be covered. So send that to me or Ember back there if you want to include a goal or strategy to include in so you're covered in the future. We would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so we're done with the mitigation plan. Any other questions? All right, one of the big, big ones, scope of work. So this is only for the planning one right now. This is what the planning one looks like. There's two pages. You add, add an activity, so that was, uh, you click on this button over here. So it, ha it auto populates the title. There's an example one, the Mountain County Mitigation Planning Grant. What type of mitigation activity? You would click on the Add Activity button, and it'll pop up this. And if you remember those activity codes, there's like, I don't know, like 80 or so activity codes. There's less for the planning ones, though. <coughs> So for the planning one, if you're doing a local multi-hazard mitigation plan, you click on 91.1 or a tribal one right here. There's the tribal multi-hazard uh, mitigation plan. And you just click on one of those and 
So it would either be one of these and uh, you're good to go for a planning one. And it showed up there, so there's an example, 91.1, the local mitigation plan. Describe the geographic area. There's an example of what someone put. Just a brief description of what the planning area would be for the mitigation plan. And then you can scroll down and identify the sources of hazards and just some of the basic hazards that you are aware of currently that your, your uh, jurisdiction is vulnerable to or that the plan will address. And then the last page for the planning grant. So right there it says, are you going to develop a new plan or update an existing plan? And then you would just click on one of those. If a plan update, then you have to describe the evaluation process of the existing plan. Um, I guess right here. So this person just said they had a lot more to say. So that Word document, they said just see the, our Word document where we actually spelled it out in more detail so they didn't have to write it a whole bunch here. What are the primary sources of information and data and how it will be incorporated? So you mean you could use data from uh, UGS, uh, the Weather Service, things like that, where you're going to get your data. What staff, if you're going to use a contractor or in-house, things like that, you would put in, in there. Pretty basic things. Um, what resources will be, you'll be using. Um, if you want to attach the file, that's where you attach it. And save and continue. And that's the uh, extent of the scope of work for planning. Pretty easy for planning. <laughs> Any questions for plans? Okay, let's do project now. You have three pages. So your title's there. You identify your hazards. You can pick more than one. Uh, whatever project your uh, whatever hazards your project you're mitigating against. Um, what type again? So you click on add activity, and this is the one. That looks, like, I guess it's got 79 activity codes. And then there was the two new ones, the one for advanced assistance, and if you're doing the resilient infrastructure, so I would imagine there'd be 81 activity codes. Oh, it's under planning? Oh, okay, perfect, okay. It's under planning. So, like we say, we recommend you just pick one, the most relevant one, <coughs> so your budget will be a lot easier. There's a list of all of them. <laughs> and you can filter by different ones, whatever, just search, find the one that works. And then it says provide a clear and detailed description of your proposed activity. So here's where I would recommend the very first sentence. Just say exactly what it is first before you have any other description or detail or anything. Um, it would be very, very helpful. This one, the proposed project includes a seismic retrofit of this building, this building, this building, this building, this building. That's, I understand what's going on there. Are you doing this, are you doing construction in this project? Yes or no? If you are doing construction, then that alerts, uh, there's gonna be where you're gonna have an um, environmental historic preservation flag, because if you do construction, then there are certain things that may come into play um, with the EHP requirements. So FEMA needs to know if you are doing construction or not. Um, page two, your Latin long of the uh, project, where it is. Um, briefly describe the need for this activity, who will, who will the mitigation activity benefit, and how will the mitigation activity be implemented. You could put those in. And like I say, the entire student and faculty population, both schools, totaling. This is where you sell your story to FEMA and how it will be implemented. And like I say, we don't need to know what, what size of nails you're using because that has actually caused problems before because they ended up realizing they had to switch the actual type of bolts or something they were using and you have to hold, do a whole process. So. <laughs> And describe how the project is technically feasible and will be effective in reducing the risk by reducing or eliminating damage to property. Read that and then you put your answer in there. So pretty straightforward stuff. Who will manage and complete the mitigation activity? 
will be different for everyone. And then page three, you have one, two, three, four questions. And just more of your story. Will the project address the hazards identified? Um, when will the mitigation activity play, take place? And like Jana said, do not list dates because you don't know when your project will be awarded and you want to be held to that. You can list months. It'll take 24 months. It'll take, um, you know, this long. Like don't list scheduled for March 2013, things like that. That's caused problems. So, so please don't do that. Explain why this project is the best alternative. So this one sometimes people struggle with. You need to tell FEMA that there were alternatives and this was the best option. And one of those can be, can be do nothing. If we do nothing, these are the consequences. This is why we should do this. Or we thought about this option, but we didn't choose it because of this. So, so come up with alternatives and why your project was the best alternative. Please identify the entity that will perform any long-term maintenance. So if there's any maintenance on there, who will do it? What's the estimate cost per year? Things like that, just basic, basic things. If it starts to get too long, I would have it in an attachment and then just give the brief description and say see attachment, whatever, if it gets too long. A lot of people will repeat these questions. They'll have the exact same stuff, the stories, and it gets it gets kind of uh, old to read because the same stuff is said. All right, so properties now. So this, so if your project involves properties, you're going to have to um, tell us some information about each property. Which, if you have a lot, it, it could uh, be a little bit cumbersome, but. Um, so you click on this add in property or you can actually import properties, I believe from Excel, if you have the, what they need, you could just import it, like right there, <coughs> from Excel. And so they want to know things like uh, property information. So you have property owner information, property action information, return to properties. So you have your street number, unit type, things like that. Um, the latitude, the longitude, the year that the property was built, the structure types are, you know, two to fam uh, four family manufactured home, non-residential, things like that. Uh, a brief legal description. Um, does this property have an NFIP policy number? And you could talk to your local floodplain manager who should have that or the state floodplain manager can get you in touch with anyone to help you with that. FMA repetitive loss and FMA severe repetitive loss. So most likely it would be no, we have zero SRL severe repetitive loss properties in Utah and like say hardly any repetitive loss. Um, and then the identify the hazards to be mitigated for that property and the property action is, is it acquisition, is it elevation, is it other, is it a wildfire retrofit, et cetera. Pick the, the, the action that will be done to that property. Um, so property information number two, is the property substantially damaged? So if, you have, if, you're, if you're doing an acquisition and you have 20 properties, you're gonna have to do that 20 times one for each property. Okay, so here's the schedule. This is where you will input it. Your description of the task, the starting point, and who will complete the work. Pretty straightforward. You can choose days, weeks, months, or years. And like we said, overestimate it. Try to use the full time. Um, there's always problems, and there's no harm in getting done early. Um, so I would, I would just estimate taking the whole time, but we've had ones that get done in a couple months and it's no problem. But we have lots of them that take the full time and we have to do a time extension, so. Um, so there's just an example, you know, hire a contractor to develop plan. That's just a, a one-liner one just 
to show you what it looks like, one starting point, the days, the duration, were completed by, and then you would just keep adding the number of line items. So, so there's kind of a, a longer one, but like we said, keep it simple to the, to the main task. Um, and so you won't have to report on it as much on your quarterly report. Cost estimate, this is what the cost estimate window looks like. And as you can see, if you clicked on an activity type, it will require that you have a minimum of two line items. So for, if you clicked on multiple activity codes, you're gonna have to do multiple line items. Um, so you'd click on the add item button up there and it'll pull up this screen and you have your item name. So name what that main line item, if it's construction or engineering or pre-award. The budget class, so you have personnel, supplies, travel, other fringe equipment, if it's contractual, construction, or indirect charges. And the sub-grant class, unit quantity, unit of measure, unit cost. So it depends on how you want to do this. Sometimes people will put for like the unit quantity and you, yeah, they'll just put like one each and the whole amount or if you have like hours you could do you know it's 80 hours by this many how much they get paid Jenna yeah and like we said for this like you can put all that calculation in the bigger table but to keep things simple here I would just say construction one construction each equals the total amount so. Yeah, and that's what we've seen most people do is one of each or one of whatever whatever category applies here. Okay, so that's kind of what one looks like. So for a plan, they have staff, time and benefits, support costs, travel, supplies and printing. Um, it says... Uh, so, like I say, you'll have this on eGrants, but one of the requirements is you have a budget narrative. And there's no option to put a budget narrative in eGrants except as an attachment. So that Word document we talked about where you're going to include your scope of work, your schedule, your budget, and budget narrative, you'll take this budget and it's got to look exactly like whatever's in eGrants or your Word document and then you'll take for your budget narrative, you'll have for every one of these line items, you'll put that in your budget narrative and have a description of what that entails and then how you came up with that cost. So if you had like say travel for 3,000, you say this many miles at this cost equals $3,000. So that's where you have to justify it. Or we'd hire a contractor for this much, you know, they get paid this much. So this is the cost share. So in order to apply for your grant, you will have to have a match letter from each, from each, from, you know, the sub applicant. So you need a letter stating that we, the city will provide 25% of the cost and we, the funds are available on this date. So FEMA needs to know that they have insurance that the, the sub-applicant will match the grant, the 25% share. So you need to attach that, the, the match letter. And this is just where you say the information. So like we say, we really highly recommend that it equals 75% and 25%. Um, so you put your proposed federal share and the proposed non-federal share to add up to 100%. And the source agency, where is this coming from? Is it coming from, um, well, the name, but is it, um, how do I have an example here of what it looks like? Uh, let's see here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I wanted to see. So you have local agency funding, other or private or state. So where is the funding coming from? The funding type, is it admin, is it cash, consulting fees, engineering fees? Most people are picking cash or other if it's in-kind. 
I, I don't th know if I've ever seen any of the other ones picked, but so, and then just the amount of your cost share, the date of availability, and there's your funds commitment letter date. So the date that you got your match letter, or I guess they call it here, the funds commitment letter, what's the date of that letter that it was signed? And then you upload it in here. And there's an example of a finished one. And that's cost share, so we're, we're almost done here. Cost effectiveness, so this is only for projects. This is where you're going to input your BCA stuff. So attach the benefit cost analysis if completed for this project. Click on attach. The net present value of benefits compares the value of benefits today versus the value of future benefits. So, and then you have what the total project cost estimate and what is the benefit cost ratio. So typically you can have the, the, the engineer who who did this for you um, to inc help you fill out this information or they can help they can fill it out and you just need to make sure you have a a ratio of one or greater and like Brad said a lot of times we have information on this that does not actually match what's in the BCA because things that went back and forth and FEMA will catch that and say well why does it not match yeah I would recommend getting the BCA done early it'll help you and uh, there's, the planning grant has no BCA, it doesn't, doesn't apply, uh, only, only for projects. So is there any questions on um, this? So this will just be essentially like the summary of the whole BCA. It'll just, it'll just give a quick thing on, we can see that it's greater than one and what's the net present value of the project benefits. For the attachment, not only just that data, but a lot of times the contractor may have to use additional documentation to support a... So there are certain defaults and if they don't use the FEMA default they need to support it and if if your contractor doesn't provide that they can actually get, get disqualified from the grant. So you have to provide everything with the BCA, not just the actual file from the software but any supporting documentation that went into that um, because FEMA takes it serious and we've had grants denied because they couldn't support it. So I, that BCA file is the biggest file of the whole grant. Like it takes megabytes of data. Okay, and then EHP. So again, this is only for uh, um, projects because plans don't have any of, uh, don't apply for this. So you have all these different acts that are required by federal law. Um, and we will go into that next. Um, I'm just going to show you the e-grants portion. We'll just do a quick presentation on uh, the EHP process. Um, but you'll have to go through those and most things don't apply like coastal zone and you're not usi using farmland or certain, certain things but you got to be aware. So this is A, National Historic Preservation Act. So you just follow these and if you don't know, they have explanations on what they are. If you click on them, save and continue, the Endangered Species Act, etc. You get through those. Usually that, that it's not too involved. Um, you have your evaluation. So by checking the not applicable box and not providing the information in this section, I understand that this application may not be selected for the PDM competitive grant, nor LPDM, which doesn't exist anymore. So the evaluation, page one of two. This is where <coughs> most people have a hard time with because they don't know if they are a CRS community. They don't know if they're a CTP. They don't know if they're a Firewise community. How do you know what the international codes are? It has a re recipient adopted these? What's the BCEGS rating? So in the aid we, we will send you, we have a couple of those. I'll provide you with every CRS community in the state for the cooperating technical partner. Everyone here should click no. There's only one for the entire state and she's over there. So no community is a CTP. 
So everyone should click no on that. If you're a Firewise community, uh, you click yes or no, and I would assume 99% of you are not. I think the biggest town I saw was Stockton. Most are like a road or an HOA with a few houses on it. So if there's any city bigger than Stockton, you're more than likely not on there. I think Sundance might have been, but... And then I don't know your codes. So you can't call me and say, what is your code? You're going to have to go to your city or county and find out what your codes are, because I have no clue. Um, I can give you an old BCEGS from our mitigation plan, but I don't know any current ones um, for all the communities in Utah. And there, there's an old, old example of what some of them are. Uh, this is essentially accurate except for, I can't remember who's off now, Centerville, I think, I can't remember. And those are some of the, there's a few more now, but as you can see, it's pretty small. Like, I think there's like 16 or so now or something. All right, so the evaluation page two. How will this mitigation activity leverage involvement of partners to enhance its outcome? BS it here, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, describe how this planning activity will benefit your community and how the plan data will be used to promote resiliency. So this evaluation has a lot of these buzzwords. Um, where you continue to sell your, your story to FEMA. Once you're done with the evaluation, click Save and Continue. And the assurances and certifications. So FEMA requires that you complete the applicable ones and I would make sure that they are the most up-to-date ones because I think one year they weren't the accurate ones and I think you had to Google to find the correct one but if it is you can just download it fill it out and sign it and upload it as an attachment um, for their non-construction so that one would apply if you're not assurance that you're not doing any construction um, certifications regarding lobbying debarment etc and the disclosure of lobbying activities And then you would just attach them there. Complete, complete. And this is where you would add your Word document that includes the scope, the schedule, budget, budget narrative, that you essentially your, your workable e-grants application. And this is where you can attach any maps. Um, if you're doing a project of a building, I would include pictures of the whole thing because a lot of times FEMA just doesn't understand. We've had projects where they actually have to come out and physically see. So pictures are highly helpful in these grants to allow FEMA to see what is going on. Um, this is where you can include your flood insurance rate map with your project to, so FEMA can see where your flood um, risk is com compared to your project and any other attachments, engineering st uh, uh, documents, things like that. Um, and as you can see we're complete the entire application is complete once you I don't have screenshots of this but once you do that it will allow you to submit the application to the state of Utah so it'll go from you guys to us and then we will review it and then we have the option to submit it back to you if you need to make any fixes um, because on January 31st, when we click the whole grant, when we submit it to FEMA, that's it. We submit it to FEMA. You will be able to get back into e-grants if, if you get uh, selected for notification and FEMA requires more information, um, then you can, we can submit it back to you. Um, but FEMA will not accept incomplete applications, typically, what they're asking for is clarification um, or just something minor was missing. Like we say, you got to be um, specific but not too specific. Um, it's kind of a fine balance. Use those buzzwords 
they, they like to he hear resiliency and climate change and whatever, you know. 